This Week in Startups is brought to you by Squarespace. Turn your idea into a new website. When you're ready to launch, use offer code TWIST to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Pendo, a product cloud that helps digital product teams understand and guide their users, enabling them to build software experiences customers love. Visit pendo.io slash twist for two months of Pendo free. And Salesforce Essentials. Jumpstart sales and support by leveraging the world's number one CRM at a startup price point at just $25 a month per user. Go to salesforce.com slash twist for an additional 50% off and a free onboarding call. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups, the podcast we host 100 times a year and have been doing for a decade here in Silicon Valley. We have many different ways for people to get the seat of CEO, founder in a company. One of the ways is you're a product person and you just develop an amazing, beautiful product, right? Steve Jobs was like a product person. Sometimes you have a salesperson. They're just great at sales, right? And they just create a product and they sell the heck out of it. Other times you have engineers start companies, right? In the case of Google or Facebook. Well, my next guest has built one of the fastest growing uh, and largest companies after his seven years at LinkedIn as an engineer. His name is Jay Kreps, and he is the co-founder and CEO of Confluent. Welcome to the podcast, Jay. Thanks for having me. How would you describe Confluent? And congratulations, you just raised $125 million. That's right. On a two or $3 billion valuation. Yeah, two and a half. Two and a half. Yeah. From Sequoia Capital. Yeah. And uh, Index? And Index. Yeah, Danny Reimer. And uh, uh, yeah, it's actually Mike Volpe and oh, Matt Mike Miller. Volpe. Yeah. Oh, great. Uh, so you've got two of the great VC firms, one of the more recent ones and the greatest of all yeah. time. Uh, so you're doing something right. When did you start the company, and what was the goal of starting this company? And then even taking us back, what did you do at LinkedIn? Well, the the company is about four and a half years old. Uh, the team came from LinkedIn, and we actually created an open source project there internally. Great. And so we, you, you know, you were saying. We kind of started as engineers, but I guess for these open source projects, you're kind of the the product and the marketing and the engineer all in one. Yeah, explain and, that uh, with open source. How does yeah. an open source project work for somebody who's heard the word open source but doesn't understand how an open source project is called a project as opposed to a company, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, it's it's kind of a methodology for making software where people just contribute bits and it's done out in the open, and you can kind of see how it works and pick apart the bits of it. And um, you know, it, it kind of became pretty mainstream in a lot of these big tech companies. So a lot of the internal infrastructure at LinkedIn was built that way. And um, this is um, Apache. Yeah, yeah. So the, the system we built uh, is called Apache Kafka. Right, because Apache is the web server yeah, that everybody Apa knows. Apache is, is a web server and then a whole foundation for these open source projects. Right. And so they, they kind of help you know, govern these communities that contribute to them. Got it. Stupid question, but for people who don't know, who decides what goes into the software? You know, if there's 20 people contributing to this open source project you created at LinkedIn, who gets to decide if LinkedIn and Microsoft and Google are all contributing to it and somebody says, I don't want to add that, and Microsoft's like, no, you have to add it. That's, that's How the... does that resolve? It's one of the fascinating things about these open source projects. The, the first thing they have to do is you know, pick a governance model. It's like picking your constitution or something. Is it going to be democracy? Is it going to be dictatorship? Right. Um, Benevolent this, dictatorship. Yeah, the, the Apache projects are, are kind of a, um, you know, it's sort of representative democracy where there's some set of people who are kind of going through and approving all the changes and helping set direction. Got it. Um, and, and is it the first are, people who sign up are the most important? It, you know, it's, it's your based, project. Yeah, it's based on uh, contribution. So people who come and, and contribute and stick around. Uh, do it. And and so that, that works pretty well. Mm. Uh, that, that kind of incentivizes people to try and do something useful. So you were making this Apache, what was the name of the project? Kafka. Kafka. Yeah. Like the and writer. Like the writer. Yeah. Was he a surrealist or? Yeah. Yeah. Kind of. And you picked that? Kafka? Yeah. yeah. You're a fan? Uh, yeah. A little bit. You know, yeah. we had we had a, we had a, um, you know, for these internal projects, they always have goofy names. So we had right. Harry Potter characters. We had a database named Baltimore for a while. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, and then we switched to writers. So what was this project, Kafka, that you built at uh, in the Apache framework? Uh, 
What was the goal of that at LinkedIn? Yeah, you know, like um, the transition LinkedIn was going through was, um, you know, kind of moving off, you know, running big Oracle databases and then moving to this world of like big distributed systems that have data all around the world and kind of scale on bunches of servers. And so, you know, we were doing a bunch of things to try and make that transition. And one of the things we thought you needed was something that would work off of streams of data. And so mm-hmm. we thought like, look, you could look, you could think of all the clicks on a social network and all the updates to people's profiles and all the emails. You could see that as some stream of changes and you could build all kinds of things around that. And so we built, uh, you know, a system that did that. And we spent about five years, you know, turning that into something that kind of scales around the world with trillions of events flowing through it in real time. And then uh, as that was open sourced, it got really popular, mostly just in Silicon Valley. So all the, you know, the Ubers and Pinterests and Airbnbs all chose this architecture that was kind of built around these real time streams. And so a way for somebody to think about this is, hey, it used to be you have a database of, say, books at Amazon, every book ever made. And every day they put 500 new books in. Yeah. But when you start thinking about tracking real-time data, say on Twitter, you might have somebody who uses Twitter every day like, comment, retweet, um, and uh, tweet 500 times a day themselves. Yeah. And then you might have 10 million of those people doing it all day long, or 100 million, and now you've got 5 billion or 50 billion uh, behaviors, moments um, being added to a database. Yeah, that's exactly right. So like in some sense, traditional databases, you, you would hear the phrase data warehousing mm-hmm. and it's, it's kind of like in Indiana Jones, you know, that big warehouse. Yeah, where sure. Where the, the Ark of the Covenant is. And... Yeah, it's all full of data and you might yeah. go ask it some question, but the, the answer is out of date by the time you get it. Right. But for, you know, for these much more real time, you know, consumer sites, you, that kind of doesn't cut it. You're not like producing updates for your users at the end of the day. You're you're doing something continuously, and so so it does work much more like Twitter, where there's some feed of all the changes that are kind of flying at you, and you kind of process it as it occurs. And this required a different database architecture yeah. than the one that came before it. Explain the paradigms of these databases, and we all hear about Oracle. They've built this ginormous, you know, trillion dollar business or whatever it is in terms of revenue over the last decade around the concept of these, you know, huge databases, but the open source systems came in and challenged them or replaced them or evolved them. How how do we look at it versus what people used to do? I I think there's like a huge transition happening right now where, you know, there was traditional databases like Oracle Um, with the emergence of these kind of consumer tech startups, you had people that were like using data in a completely different way and they kind of built their own databases, which was what LinkedIn was doing and Facebook was doing and Google was doing. Why did they make their own? Was it a function of what? You know, it's a bunch of things. Like one, the whole company is kind of built in software Mm -hmm. in a way that was pretty niche, you know, maybe uh, 20 years ago and is now becoming very mainstream and all kinds, you know, everything from grocery stores to car companies would think about themselves that Mm -hmm. way. Um, So they just had a lot more data. It was much more deeply intertwined with how they served customers and then the scale is a lot, lot larger. It's just a lot mm. more data about more things. And was so, it also did it also have to do with the arduous nature of maybe getting through the Oracle sales process to buy and spend a million dollars on a license to build a database when you're doing some social network that has tons of data, but no um, tons of data, but maybe you have no revenue yet. Yeah, you know, I maybe that's part of it. The yeah. um, but but I think a lot of the big change came uh, not from that because you know they were able to hold hold on to that for a long time mm-hmm. and what's actually kind of chipped away at it has been you know these totally different ways you know totally different requirements totally different product mm-hmm. something that runs across a fleet of servers in the cloud you know it's just built completely differently for different use cases yeah. and and so of course then people like uh, these open source uh, software components they love these cloud services where you can just buy what you need and pay for what you use and you're not locked in forever. Um, and so that, that's been a huge part of it, but I think without this kind of change in how people think about data, I I don't, I don't think you would have, uh, gotten, gotten in there with just a better sales model. And so you have this open source project that everybody's benefiting from, and then you decide Confluent will become a for-profit company that provides what around this open source project? Yeah. You know, we were, so we were looking at what was happening. We we thought, look, we have 
you know, huge adoption, you know, basically in a, a 50 mile radius of where we are. Like all the Silicon Valley tech companies are using this. Everybody else is interested, but like they need something that's much more of a product and plugs into all the systems they have. Got it. They want something that can be like a cloud service or that can be, you know, easy to manage in their data centers. They don't adopt technology the mm. same way that uh, the kind of tech companies do. Right. And, and so we thought, like, if, if we really want to make this something real, uh, we, we got to really turn it into a real product and take it out into the world. Right. And so that's what we do. So we, we you know, we, we provide a version of this that's, you know, secure, that, that, you know, scales elastically, that you can run across data centers. And then we, you know, help companies actually get that going and run it. And then we offer it as a, you know, as a service in the cloud. So you can just kind of, you know, pay for what you use and, and get it without having to do any of the work yourself. Amazing. When we get back from this quick break, I want to understand how you made that transition from being a team of engineers to going out and raising that first round of funding and convincing people that this open source project could then become a project that actually generates real revenue, becomes a sustainable business and a company when we get back on This Week in Startups. It's time for you to turn your great idea, perhaps even your startup idea, into a website. What are you going to do? You're going to use Squarespace because you need a beautiful website with incredible functionality from blogging to e-commerce, and you want everybody on the team to be able to quickly edit and update the website, and you want to get a great price. Whether you're trying to sell products or services or promote an online business or maybe a physical real world business, maybe you're doing an event that we do a lot of events or a special project, bing, bang, boom, you can get your Squarespace website up and running immediately with their beautiful templates that are customizable, powerful e-commerce functionality, and it's all optimized for mobile, tablet. You make it, it looks beautiful in all different screen sizes. And you get analytics, plus you can buy domains and choose from over 200 extensions. You may have seen, I, you, I did uh, angel.university and founder.university using Squarespace. It's free, it's secure, and 24 seven award-winning customer support. So here is your call to action. I want you to visit squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, just use that offer code TWIST, T-W-I-S-T, and you'll save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. I love Squarespace. They've been a credible supporter of this podcast. And every month, every quarter, week in, week out, they're delivering new features. This is one of the great things about cloud software and the, and the movement. Squarespace just keeps listening to those customers and adding new features, and then you can just see it in the product and the functionality. And the price stays the same, and the value goes up. That's efficiency. That's what entrepreneurship is about, building a better mousetrap, and that better mousetrap is Squarespace. So go ahead and visit squarespace.com. Use the promo code TWIST to save 10% off your first purchase. Okay, let's get back to this amazing website. I'm sorry, amazing podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. My guest today, Jay Krebs from... A unicorn you may not have heard of, but everybody here in Silicon Valley is talking about Confluent uh, was founded just four and a half years ago. In that time, they've built a business worth $2.5 billion, according to the smartest investors in the room. That's Sequoia Capital and Index. Uh, we should know schlubs uh, in and of themselves. They're and pretty benchmark, great. And Benchmark, I should, th oh, I should get, to get their too. name in there as well, wow. right? Otherwise- They did uh, your Series A or something? They did the Series A. Really? Who yeah. at Benchmark? Uh, Eric Vishria. Oh, wow. Great. Bill Gurley, my good friend who's been on the pod. All right. Um, another so tall guy. <laughs> another, yeah. You're, people don't know because we're both sitting here. I'm 5'9 on a good day. You're 6'5. Yeah. But you've never dunked a basketball. I know. Completely wasted. Heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. You, you could literally be in the NBA, but instead you went I to the NBA. I threw it all away. <laughs> yeah. <Valley. laughs> um, so your four founders, so they're pre IPO yeah. for LinkedIn. That's exciting. I guess you did pretty good since you were the tech team there. I'm sure you had some nice options. Yep. Yeah, it was Got great. to ride that. And then you decide at some point, hey, this project could, this Apache uh, Kafka project could turn into a for-profit uh, company that builds products and services around the open source project. Yeah. You're not the first person to do this. This has happened many times now, a dozen yeah. times. Yeah, yeah, there's a number of these. Uh, Hadoop yep. became yeah. Datastax, is yeah, that right? Yeah, it became uh, Cloudera. Cloudera. Yep. And then Datastax was based on a yeah another a, a, Apache Cassandra. Cassandra, yeah, I'm an investor in Datastax. Oh, really? Great. Yeah, just yeah. I met them, and yeah, I think they're a unicorn too now. <laughs> yeah, it's a similar similar story. The the technology came out of Facebook, and yeah, they started a company around it. Yeah, so you saw some of that happening. So yep. the, the roadmap was there. 
Yeah, and more than that, you know, we kind of believed a lot of these technologies that were being, you know, developed in house in mm -hmm. the kind of consumer tech giants were going to be really mainstream. Yeah, you know, we were it. kind of looking at what was happening in the world. We were like, look, everybody, every company is going to have stuff like this. Yeah, and it's either going to be our stuff or it's going to be somebody else's stuff. It's interesting how the use case then opens up uh, the ability to invest. So LinkedIn is doing so well, Facebook's doing so well, Twitter's doing so well. It gives those companies permission and even the necessity to invest heavily, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars into these open source projects. Yeah. Um, and then to, to solve their problem, we, we got to track likes, we got to track people's yeah. feeds, et cetera. Yeah. Once that happens, I would guess a bunch of other people who are technologists or you know uh, entrepreneurs look at that technology and say, I have an idea for what that database, that new architecture could do. What other projects now outside of social networking are taking advantage of this Apache Kafka and Confluent offering? Yeah, you know, it's it's everywhere. So it it would show up in, you know, ride sharing, like like Lyft and Uber. It would show up in uh, big retailers. What are they doing um, at like the ride sharing? They they have to track GPS locations. Yeah, of you know, it's it's all of the locations of all the all the drivers it's, in real time. In real time, it's calculating supply and demand so they can set the prices. It's you know helping wow. get all the data to match you to the right the right pickup. Um, if there are a million drivers on the road right now, what would that mean in terms of data points coming in? Yeah, it's and it's, how often is it sending the GPS it, location every you, ten you know, seconds? It's, it's amazing. If you if you look at the large users of these data systems now, they have literally like trillions of messages a day that go through. trillions. A day. Yeah, you know, globally distributed around the world. So the the use of data inside companies has just changed so much in right. the last ten years. It's amazing. And, and how do they manage it on a global basis? Do they have to make it into pockets and clusters of databases? Because yeah. you start looking at like the number of rides in China. Then you look at, oh, well, there's 10 cities with over 30 million people. And the number, each of those is the equivalent of maybe the whole ride sharing footprint here in America. So how do you, do these databases all wind up connecting or... It's actually a huge problem. That's yeah. um, you know that's what's motivated. We're talking about what motivated this next round of data yeah. systems, and it's you know the days of having one database on one server somewhere, rebuilding in one it, data center, sharding it. Yeah, that's over. These are now these distributed systems that are around the world, and so you know one of the things we provide as a company is a hosted service. So you can just you know this problem of how do we get clusters up all around the world and globally connect them. That's something yeah. you know we kind of do for you, which is an immensely hard technical problem. Racking those servers would be well, arduous. Even, you know, even we provide our our cloud service in AWS. So yeah. there's, you know, under all the layers, there's somebody racking servers. But uh, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, you can so get you, it kind of at the click of a button. You have a cloud service offering. Yeah. And if you were to strip it all away, you're renting server space at AWS. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And then so you're built on top of it to yeah, get that. Yeah, we're there. providing this kind of data system as a service, so Got you it. you can just get it instead of having to set it up and run it yourself. That's amazing. So now we're abstracting layers upon yeah. layers. Yeah. And today you made some huge announcement with Google. Yeah, that's what right. What was that? That's right. So we're, um, you know, what we've done is is taken our service and natively integrated it into their cloud as well. So, oh. you know, it kind of looks like a seamless part of their offering. You can go down the list of services and see uh, Confluent Cloud there. Um, we're doing work to integrate the billing and the support and all of that, mm. uh, which, is, which is a really cool thing. When people look at these cloud services, the bills have been starting to get very big yeah. for some of these big companies. Yeah. Is there a point at which companies who are hitting scale, it makes more sense for them to actually start racking servers again? I think it's extremely rare. So we, okay. you know, we we provide our offering on premise. We provide it in the cloud. You know, the direction is mostly on premise to cloud. Mm. You know, we in fact we kind of connect all that up and help companies do that. Mm. But the, um, you know, there's there's a few of these exceptional cases where either you know your Facebook and your level of scale is so high that nobody's even solving for that problem, and you have to eke out pennies on every single thing you do. Um, or where you do something really specialized. So you've heard oh. about companies like uh, Dropbox, sure. where they've taken some specialized system that stores all the files, and they've just really built that out from servers to everything else. But you know, for most companies, it, it's not you know what's holding them back on the cloud is not has nothing to do with cost. It has mm. everything to do with just legacy software and how can you kind of connect that up to new applications that would be there. When you brought this to the to the venture community, how did they react? Uh, they Understand open source enough now to to see this path clearly, this playbook. 
Yeah, you know, it was interesting. It's it, it was an interesting time because you know I think the open source companies were not that well understood. Um, beyond that, it wasn't even clear what the category of thing we were had was. We so we could say, okay, look, this is really popular, and they would be like, well, is it a database? And we're like, well, kinda, yeah, but really different. And, you know, is it? Uh, and so so it was uh, it was definitely work to explain it. Um, yeah. And then you know, but but I think like the the venture community generally responds well to traction. You know, the one thing you can't BS your way through is like yeah. real people doing valuable things with your product, whatever it is. Yeah, that they, the attention of smart people on the platform, smart people are not going to engage to do you a favor or you're not going to be able to fake that. Yeah, you know, I think if you're in the business of having people come and tell you hopeful stories all day long, you kind of get, you start to just discount it. And so yeah. the things that are hard to fake, I think are the things that people believe most in. So that was one of our big learnings in the early fundraising was we would go through this long pitch about why this was all inevitable. At the last slide, we would show some traction, which was amazing for this open yeah. source project. And then, you know, the whole time the venture people would be like, on their phones, not paying attention. The last slide, they're like, "Holy shit!" Yeah. So, so then the we were like, "Put that, slide. yeah, put that up for us." Uh, that was our. our it's genius. interesting. I wrote a blog post recently. I was like, "If you want to close funding immediately, have this chart." And yeah. <laughs> the chart is we're doubling every four months. Yeah. Because any company that can double every three, four, five months, you know, with whatever amount of resources they have, if given more resources, yeah. they could grow faster. You've been. Year over year, what's the revenue growth like at a company like yours to hit these kind of levels, unicorn levels, since we're yeah, having we, unicorn we, companies? Yeah, we grew up. over 3x, uh, you, you know, it's closer to about 3.5x uh, last year to this year. Wow. Yeah. So 2019 yeah. versus 2018 is going to be 3x. Uh, t- uh, 2017 to 2018. It was 3x. Yeah, 2019 is still happening. <laughs> yeah. And you think you can do another 3x or yeah, more we're, like a 2x? We're, we're going pretty quick. So, yeah. So we'll see. Um, but, but it gets yeah, harder been... as you get the numbers get bigger. Yeah, that's right. That's right. This, you know, this last year we we're definitely getting to scale. You know, the company is like 500 people. We have a bunch of customers. 500 uh, people. Yeah. Where are you based? Yeah. Well, everywhere. You know, yeah. the uh, headquarters is in Palo Alto, uh, but we have an office up here in San Francisco. We've got offices in London. We got really folks all around the world. What are your thoughts on Silicon Valley? And the, you know, you started this four and a half years ago, I think. So that was right before it got ca- crazy here. More is. Crazy. At this point, if you were starting today, would you even be able to or consider starting here? Or would you just think, I got to move this to LA or Toronto or Vancouver? Yeah, yeah. You know, that's an interesting question. Like the, we've done what a lot of companies have done, which has just gotten really liberal about where we'll hire people. Mm. And the the collaboration tools make that a lot easier. The, yeah. the one thing Silicon Valley still has that's hard to get elsewhere is the pool of startup executives. You know, I think the venture people have gotten much more liberal about being willing to travel and invest elsewhere. Yeah. Um, but the pool of startup executives just doesn't really exist everywhere. Right. And it's a particular thing. You know, you, you may be an executive in a, in a large corporation. It's not quite the same thing as coming in and, yeah. you know, building a team from scratch and, and, and really scaling something. Yeah. If you want a Google PM or somebody who was at Facebook when they were under 100 people or somebody who did the sysadmin at whatever company, Twitter, maybe that's a bad example. So the fail well was up all the time. But. No, no. I, I mean, I think any of those maybe companies good, where they're yeah. going through crazy growth, yeah. um, you know, I, I think it's a very different job to, to do that. And so having people who've been through that before is just, you know, really, How really is it valuable. different? Um, you know, like the, for most companies just aren't growing at that fast of a rate. You yeah. know, if you look at the, you know, the category of growth public companies, it's usually about 20% a year. If you're, you know, a small startup growing at 20% a year, you're, no. You got nothing, right? Yeah. So you're shutting so it you down. Got, you're Sell gonna, it for assets. Yeah, you're going to be doing it much, much faster than that. And that ability to kind of come in and put it all together from scratch, you know, pull together a team, put together a strategy, that's actually something you rarely get the mm. opportunity to do in a larger company. Yeah, it's sort of like getting the ability to like work on a film that, you know, has a certain budget or something. Like working on a Pixar film, the number of people who worked on a computer animated short or feature was like, 10 people. Yeah, I, I at a certain point it's time. a good it's a good analogy. I, I do think startups and movies have some similarities and that yeah. they kind of somehow assemble a team out of nothing. Yeah. You know, put together these this amazing pool of talent, build something great and then, you know, with the movie they throw it all away and do, yeah. you know, start from scratch the next time, but uh, with yeah. a startup hopefully it keeps well, going. Well, I you know, you unless it's a sequel, in which yeah. case they're just like <laughs> Yeah, that's right. I guess now you have like, more get of the a, Boba a Fett perpetual costume. model. That's right. Let's that's go. Right. We just need the Darth yeah. Vader costume. We can use the same one. <laughs> all right. I'm going to give you a tough question right now. Yeah, do it. But we're going to go to commercial so you have at least 90 seconds to think of an answer. There are things 
that you've made possible with this high scale technology. Um, that was driven because nobody ever thought there would be a billion people on a social network doing hundreds of activities each and this need for it. What is this technology not capable of yet, but that in 10 years it might be capable of? And what might that unleash on the world? What use case, what problem that we can't currently solve with the technology, but that we're a decade or two away from actually having this technology be able to solve this problem or provide this opportunity in the world that may be even hard for people to think about or get their brains around a database or data being able to do this when we get back on This Week in Startup. Do you build or manage a SaaS product? Well, I have something for you. It's called Pendo, P-E-N-D-O. And if you install it in your app, it's going to give you a rich set of application level data. That means you put in a little code and then you find out what your users are doing. And maybe there's something very frustrating for them in your app that you can fix. Or maybe there's something that's delighting them or a feature that you've been arguing in your staff meetings about what people are doing with the app and you find out they're not using feature A, but they're using feature B twice as much as you thought. This is the kind of actionable insight that companies like OpenTable, Zendesk, Glassdoor, Instacart, Marketo, and two of my investments, 15.5 and Lee Genius, these are the companies using Pendo to quickly understand user behavior in their apps so they can make better products. And that's what you want to do. If you get rid of some features nobody's using, you can take all of that maintenance time and developer time and simplify your code base and product and then put it into the features that are being used. Well, Sprinkler, which I'm a shareholder in, uh, they're using it to do onboarding of new users and to convert their uh, free trials to paid trials. You get all these like very nuanced user flows. Well, they're doing that to guide the legacy customers into adopting the new digital platforms and reducing support tickets while improving NPS, net promoter score, critical uh, for any uh, great startup. And the best part is no engineering resources are needed. So here is your call to action, pendo.io, P-E-N-D-O dot I-O slash twist. Again, pendo.io slash twist, and you will get not one, but two, two free months of Pendo. That's right. Also, Pendo's product craft community is producing a great event for product teams, and that event is taking place at the Palace of Fine Arts in San Francisco on May 9th. You can learn more and snag a discount code at pendo.io slash twist. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis, and my guest today, Jay Kreps, formerly of LinkedIn, where he was a pre-IPO uh, employee. What employee number were you? You must know. If you're I, 2007. I think it was around 160, something like that. 160. Yeah. Was Reed, Reed Hoffman in the building when you yeah, were there? Yeah, yeah. He was actually the first person at LinkedIn I met. Really? Yeah, yeah. Why is Reed so successful? Uh, you know, he has an interesting approach where he seems to just talk to everybody and be a really nice guy. It's nice to see that that can work. Wait a second. He's really successful about being an a-hole <laughs> or a D-bag in Silicon Valley. It is possible. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, it, it I agree. seems to be that, like, you know, uh, you, you never seem to catch him when, when that comes away and, and yeah. people love him and want to work with uh, him. What was it like there in the early days when, when there were 100 employees at LinkedIn? And uh, what was it, like 5 million users or something? Yeah, it was point? great. That's right. Yeah, it was, it was pretty early. Um, you know, it was interesting that the, for any of these companies, you have so many big ideas early mm -hmm. on. Yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of people uh, joined because of Reed. So there was, mm. you know, a thousand and one ways uh, that we were going to kind of change the internet. Uh, we didn't get to all of them, but, yeah. <laughs> but we got was, to some of them. Was the um, revenue turned on when you joined yet? Were they charging yeah, for that $5,000 yeah, a seat? It was just starting. You yeah. know, it was one of the things that was interesting about LinkedIn as a social network was they started a bunch of experiments early on with monetization and yeah. they all worked. Uh, you know, so. I had Reed on the podcast and it was interesting. He said that. He's like, we didn't want to charge anybody, but these HR people kept asking and haranguing us. So finally yeah. we just said, well, what can they afford? Said $5,000 a year. And I think that was the going price for a seat with like the pro account. That's um, right. That's right. 500 I think it's, a month it's or probably something. a little more now, but. <laughs> I think it might be a little more. Um, and then what was it like? You were there for the IPO? Yeah. 
Yeah, it was really What was exciting. that like to go from being the, you know, whatever, in the first hundred or so employees to then watching it IPO? You know, it was really interesting that when I joined, people really felt that um, it was a little unclear if a social network was going to be a business or not. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's similar maybe to some of these open source companies where people are like, well, but yeah. is that really a company? Remains to be yeah. seen. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, people didn't think, I didn't think advertising would work in social networks. Yeah. So I was convinced LinkedIn would work. And then before that, there was a company that was the first business. There was another social something. There was Social Net and social Friendster. Net, Friendster. Yeah, there were a couple of these social networks that came right around the same time. Oh, Mark Pincus had Tribe. Yeah. Um, and there was one or two other ones. But I, I thought advertising on a social network would be like somebody walking into a bar and getting between two people and saying, do you want to buy Kraft macaroni yeah, cheese? Yeah, and sure enough, it is a little bit like that, but and it, it still works. And it is exactly <laughs> like that. And nobody cares. And yeah. the click-through rate is terrible. Yeah. But the number of people engaged is so high that net-net it works. Yeah, and what was interesting was, you know, LinkedIn actually today is is in large part an enterprise software business. They, they sell yeah. re a recruiter product, a sales product, yeah, uh, most people don't know that, but it's actually a very interesting model yeah. uh, for a social network. They're unique in that they have this like three-sided business, that... and they have the talent business now, yeah. where you can learn skills. Yeah, and that's the, right. And the jobs right. business, where you can that's find right. a job. So they're they've really people underestimate people overestimate startups in the short term and what they can get done, and then underestimate them in the long term. Yeah, yeah. You know, it actually is made actually me a, a huge fan there. of that kind of platform technology. LinkedIn was kind of a really interesting platform that they showed they could build, you know, four or five different businesses on top of it yeah. that were all pretty successful. I think a lot of these infrastructure platforms you're now seeing in the cloud, I think we're one of them. They have that same characteristic where you have something that's popular and there's there's a bunch of different ways to monetize it. Like we're selling it as a software package, we're selling it as a cloud service, and those all seem to work. Which is you know maybe just a sign that if you have something that has traction and creates value, there's you know a number of different viable ways to make money off it. This big data thing was big a decade ago. People were talking about it, and obviously the social networks became the driving force of this. In the same way, GPUs got driven largely by mobile phones and GPS. Like yeah. It drove the um, lowering the cost and increasing the power of this technology. When I left us before the break, I was wondering in 10 years or 20 years, if we continue on this curve, what will this technology unlock? What will the ability to process such large global real-time feeds of data, what will that unlock for humanity? Yeah, you know, I, I think we're still figuring that out. You yeah. know, I, I think our vision with Kafka and with Confluent was, you know, really build something that could be kind of like the central nervous system in a body. You want something where you can connect all the parts where something happens here yeah. and the rest of the business can kind of respond in a really natural and immediate way. And that's, you know, I think as companies are getting more built out in software, that's like what's happening. That's, mm. that's kind of the architecture of a modern business. So that's, you know, I, I think it plays out in all these cool ways in different in different yeah. companies. But it's uh, it's an interesting process to watch. It's probably the most fun part of my job is I, I get to go meet with all these different companies in different industries, yeah. and they tell you how they're built and what they think that looks like now and what it's going to look like in the future. What breaks the system now? I'll take another swing at it. Yeah. What when you meet with a client, you say, we're not there yet. We can't do this. Oh, the big thing for us is, you know, we're very much like a developer layer. Yeah. And so we're, we're not as kind of point and clicky, you know, yeah. there's no interface for the business user sure. yet. Yeah. And so, you know, that's, that's the big thing, like the, Tool all sets. of these, you know, for us and, and any of these modern layers, we're not broken as much by the, you know, the scalability or servers failing mm -hmm. that this new generation of software is all kind of like built to, to live in that scale world. infinitely. Yeah. Yeah. So when a, a series of self-driving cars, let's take the, the Tesla or Uber case. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there are now a couple of hundred thousand of these Model 3s on the road. Everybody knows they have cameras and sensors around them. There's all this data coming into the car. Yeah. So as I'm driving up and down the 280 every day, they have all that data. I don't know how much of it they store if they roll it up, but is it possible to take a billion cars on the road today? Let's just assume all billion cars on the road or the first bi a billion cars that get on the road in the coming years have the same sensor arrays, cameras, et cetera. Would we be able to, in real time, with today's infrastructure, store all of that data for what's happening in every car, every frame 
of all eight cameras, 12 sensors, this, that, and the other thing. Would that data all be able to be processed in real time and stored? Or would that just take taking all computing power in the world, all storage power in the world, and just 10xing it? Yeah, no, that's very possible. So like, not only is it possible, um, Audi is a customer of ours. They, they did an amazing talk um, at, at a conference we put on. And yeah, they're, they're really building a whole generation of cars that does exactly that. And there's all these features from the traffic on the maps to, you know, telling you that there's going to be hazards up ahead to, uh, you know, helping you figure out when uh, your car needs to go in for maintenance that these car companies are, are looking at building around these streams of data. I, I think it's an amazing set of use cases. And it's like a total change in what a car is. You know, it used to be a hardware yeah. product and now it's like a yeah. hardware, software, global internet service product. And it's yeah. it's really incredible. Well, if you think of the value coming from these cars, the first couple of hundred thousand people with a Model Three, you drive one of these Teslas. The yeah, 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 yeah. I just got one of these uh, recently. You know, I didn't do that. I, I don't quite trust the self-driving you have Model 3? stuff. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you could totally zip up and down the one hundred and one and yeah, uh, two hundred and eighty, yeah, no problem. So. I, you know, I think if you uh, spend too much time building software, then you don't trust it for the first few years. Well, I'm not going to say you should get in the back seat like some dipshit did. Uh, <laughs> literally, a guy attached a clamp to his steering wheel. Oh, I didn't hear about this one. Well, you know, if you're going to put self-driving on. I tweeted it. You might be able to find it in real time. Anyway, um, the driving in real time, the guy clips a soda can, like a cup holder to the steering wheel because the way the Tesla self-driving works is you have to have a little bit of friction on the steering wheel in order for it to know that you're gripping. Yeah. So this person hacked that by putting a weight on the steering <laughs> wheel and then climbed into the back seat and videotaped yeah. it and then climbed yeah. back. They yeah. don't show him climbing back, but they show him asleep in the I, back I seat. I didn't hear about that. I heard about the, the drunk people who fall asleep with the self-driving. That, that seems like, well, maybe it's better than driving, well, see, this is but the maybe thing. they should have just gotten a ride. Of course they should have gotten a ride. The fact that the car had self-driving, you have to ask yourself, we have people drunk driving every day. People are idiots. People take their own lives. They do things that are stupid. Would you rather that person be in a car with self-driving and airbags, right? Because if you just look at self-driving as a technology like airbags, I don't think the self-driving is making people go, I should, now that I have self-driving, I should drink and drive. They're not saying that. Yeah. This person made a terrible choice. They probably would have driven anyway, just like the other people driving drunk. If it has self-driving, at least when they're on the highway, it's going to drive until it runs out of battery and then come to a stop. And if you have self-driving and you don't have your hands on the wheel... It eventually um, does an alarm, slows down, and comes to a stop and puts the hazards on. Yeah. So that's actually yeah a better parachute than not having. I it. agree. Yeah, I agree. I, you know, I think it's a hard thing for society when there's some new technology. It's always scary. Yeah. Uh, but you you actually don't think about the risk of not developing. It's true with these medical treatments. It's true yeah. with the self driving cars. You you don't think of all the people who die if you don't have it. I kind of think a medical is going to be a holy grail for you too, because we're just getting to the point at which Apple's probably going to have a glucose reader in real time soon, and there'll be some other real time, you know, data tools. You know, we already have it for our heart rates and stuff like that. But can you imagine if we had real time data on every person on the planet's heartbeat? Yeah, body temperature. I, I think it's an amazing area. It's you know it's a um, little slower moving with new technologies often, yeah. but um, already we we you know we heard from a hospital that had hooked this up. You know they they treat uh, infants who get you know brain trauma like a head injury. Yeah, and they're using it to detect uh, brain swelling. And if mm. you get brain swelling, you can get brain damage. And so you have yeah. to catch it real fast. Sure. And um, there's a couple of these use cases that are like that, where these really forward you know, thinking people have you know, turned it on that and, and actually are like saving lives. I, I think it's amazing. I think it's really yeah. cool. I think for drug discovery and all this drug testing is going to be another one. And then space seems to be another one where we're starting to get large amounts of data I don't know if you know, Yuri Milner's putting a series of satellites up. No, I haven't heard about this. Yeah. Yuri Milner is like one of the most interesting people, not in terms of making money, which is yeah. super boring, yeah. but the spending of money I find fascinating. Yeah. He's going to daisy chain like some array of satellites into the solar system to send data back and see how far he can go and get data out there and then get it back. And can you imagine sending out like whatever number? You know, as a human species, if we put 1% of our effort, like GDP and human capacity, it would be 
whatever, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people and whatever trillions of dollars to just send satellites out. Imagine we did like a Manhattan Project where yeah. 1% of the planet just worked on sending satellites to space to just try to get as much data as we could for, from out there. We could actually get pretty far in 100 or 200 years. Yeah, yeah. But the amount of data yeah. would be insane. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, if you know, if nothing else, uh, this crop of uh, Silicon Valley uh, tech billionaires certainly has, you know, more interesting side projects than than previous. Uh, Bezos uh, is going for it too. That's right. I guess he found that's out right. that Elon was putting out this like five thousand satellite cluster or ten thousand satellites. That's right. You got to keep up the with low the Joneses, Earth right? orbit you satellites. <laughs> that's going to be when you think about the impact that will have on data collection, five G, and low Earth orbit satellites. Providing broadband to the entire planet, what impact is that going to have? You think on the data sort of? Yeah, thing? yeah. I mean, I, I think it's an amazing thing if they can, if they can get people connectivity. I think that's great. Yeah, five G, extraordinary. Yeah, you operating in China and those kind of places yet? No, not yet. I mean, the the open source part of our offering is actually um, incredibly widely adopted in China. So, like, we yeah. we actually track you know downloads, uh, and there's about twice as many downloads in mm. China as the U.S. Wow, and obviously the U.S. technology sector is not small. No, so uh, so I, I think that's amazing. Uh, as a business, we're not there yet, though. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see if you can even go there if they let you. Uh, it's definitely more complicated to operate there, um, but well, but, especially if you're collecting data. They, yeah, I mean they have a and whole set of level. cloud, you know, cloud providers. Alibaba is huge. Um, you know, we yeah. we never hear about them because there's there's not as many companies building on no. you know here in the U.S. But it but it's huge in Asia. So yeah. The only problem is they pick the winners over there. It's a little bit more difficult for American it's, companies when they say, that's the winner. <laughs> yeah, it's a different operating environment. Different operating system. Well, listen, continued success with this. I guess you're going to uh, hire a gazillion more people. Yeah, we're you working have, on it. That's... How many job openings do you have right now? Oh, my God. I don't know. A uh, hundred? Yeah, at least a hundred. Uh, what, yeah, developers? A lot of, yeah, you know, all of it. You know, like if you're trying to build a company quickly like this, yeah. you, you need good people of all kinds. Is it fun to get that big that fast? I, I, I think mean, five hundred is a lot of people. I, you know, it's it's one of those things where you you want to avoid kind of crashing the car in terms of the culture of your company or you just how you operate or all that. You kind of really like try and make yourself better as you get bigger, yeah. which is not not. What that was the biggest easy. challenge for you? You know, I, I I think just making sure you, you know I think it changes each time you kind of add another layer in the company and making sure you're really in touch with what's going on and how things really operate. I yeah. think it's really important. What What was your personal biggest challenge? Oh, you know, it was together. a huge transition for me. I went from being, you know, basically an engineer and engineering manager and architect to yeah. like running an enterprise company, which is, you know, it's a completely different area. No, none of our the founders of the company knew anything about it. So, yeah. you know, the list of challenges was huge. We had to, you know, figure you like out You like that what, seat better or no? Uh, I, I think it's really fun to get to see all the parts of a yeah. company. It's a little bit like, you know, understanding all the parts of the car and how they work. Like, yeah. you know, it's really been fascinating for me. Do you ever wish you could just... Let somebody else be CEO, and then you get to go down there and just work on the tech again and be an engineer. No, you know, I, you like the you like I, the throne. I, I you like the you, cockpit seat. Uh, I think if you start something, and it's kind of like your baby. You care yeah. too much to, to to take your hands off the steering wheel. I guess. All right, listen. Continued success. It's amazing that you've gotten this far. What a great story! I think for people who are listening, you know, this is one of the great reasons to go work at a big company, right as they're about to do that tipping. Like I always tell people, like that. If you're going into if you're coming out to Silicon Valley, like yeah, going at a startup is great, but getting to that company that's at their Series B or something, they got a hundred employees, two hundred employees, even yours five hundred. Man, do you get to see up close and personal, like you did at LinkedIn? You get to see how it's done. You get to yeah. see all the mistakes. You get yeah. to see all the challenges. And you take that with you to your next one. That's seven years at LinkedIn was your MBA times four. Yeah, yeah, it was a really fun thing to see. Yeah. No, Reed and Jeff. Oh, you were there during the transition to yeah, Reed and Jeff? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, that went well. Yeah, yeah, it was wonderful. Jeff's extraordinary. All right, listen, continued success. If you want to um, work at a rocket ship, because, listen, this guy's going to go public in a year or two. You haven't filed or anything. Uh, no, no, no. So they're pre-IPO, but he's seen this movie before. I guess we'll be sitting here in two years. This will be the... Uh, this will be the episode that all the uh, bankers on Wall Street will be looking at. This company will be public in two, three years. Uh, continued success, Jay. Thanks for coming on the pod. And everybody will go check out Confluent. That's C-O-N-F-L-U-E-N-T dot com. You got the com? Dot I-O. Dot I-O. I know. We're Look at that. You raised IO's $100 like million yeah. and you're just like, I'm going to go I-O. You That's could buy right. the dot That's com. Right. Yeah, we're You've doing chosen it. to go I-O. We're doing it. The I.O. people are pretty happy with you right now. <laughs> what is the I.O. anyway? Is uh, that like a specific country or are they just... 
yeah, it's it's some island thing. We did it because you know oh. I slash O is input output. Of you course, know, so yeah, it makes total streams. sense. Yeah, yeah, you know, just don't do L Y. What happened was everybody's like, oh, Bitly or this Lee or L Y is on the way out, huh? It's Libya. Yeah. So when Libya, oh yeah, yeah, that's went, bad. That's... you know, like had chaos or whatever. It's like having Venezuela as your, you know, domain <laughs> extension. Yeah. If the country devolves, everybody loses their domain name. Yeah. Which is what happened in the uh, Libya sense. Bitly. Yeah. The URL sure yeah, was yeah, bit.ly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah with like, like half the links on the internet. Went down one weekend yeah, during yeah. the blogging. <laughs> it was hilarious. Or not hilarious. <laughs> no, yeah, All right. Uh, continue success and uh, we'll be right back. Scaling your sales team and your process is brutally hard. And this is where a lot of startups get themselves in trouble. They start to figure out sales, but it doesn't scale. Why doesn't it scale? Because you're not using Salesforce, which is the world's number one system for doing customer relationship management. Everybody knows Salesforce works best. Salesforce is the greatest. But you might be saying, is my startup too small for this? Is it too expensive? Well, I've got great news for fans of This Week in Startups. Salesforce Essentials is easy to use, out of the box, and perfect for startups at a great price point. I want you to go to salesforce.com slash twist and you will get 50% off with an annual contract and free onboard training. Salesforce is awesome and it's going to be set up instantly, same day. And you're going to be able to do everything faster and better. You're going to be able to track your emails, track your calls, and all the meetings, all from within your inbox. So I want you to automatically connect all of your support channels to Salesforce and start doing it right. When you look at a sales executive's resume, it says that they're Salesforce trained and they know how to use Salesforce. And when they come into your building and they're in your office and they sit there, the first thing they say is, where's my Salesforce login? How do I get to my dashboard? The world runs on Salesforce. And now startups can get a great price with Salesforce Essentials. That's right. Salesforce Essentials is 50% off. I can't believe it. Thank you so much to Salesforce for supporting This Week in Startups and for supporting the startups that watch This Week in Startups. So get that 50% discount. I'm not sure how long it's going to last. I want you to get in there right now. Salesforce.com slash twist. Scaling is hard unless you're using Salesforce Essentials and then it's easy breezy and you're going to get that startup price. So lock in your startup price right now. Salesforce.com slash twist twist. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Okay, we're here at Office Hours. This is my chance to interact with founders and try to help them. I try to make every interaction with the founder the most beneficial interaction they've ever had with an investor, whether I'm an investor or not, because I want them to leave, for those of you who are angel investors or aspiring ones, my goal is to have them leave, leaving the meeting pumped up and feeling like they got the best most actionable advice they've ever gotten in their lives, whether I'm an investor or not. Um, so I'm careful not to crush their souls. Um, but it's a, it really is a challenging thing because being candid with people sometimes can be jarring for you, the listener. I will assure you that any founder who should be a founder wants the most candid advice. So it's not um, a shock to them to get candid advice. In fact, they love it. And so I've decided for this next one, I'm going to be particularly brutal. Uh, Parsa, welcome to the program. Thank you very much for having me. Okay. Uh, you are doing a peer tutoring marketplace called Tutorfly. It's at tutorfly.org. Yep. Uh, I see you have a 650 number, so you're here in the Valley. Correct. Mm -hmm. How many employees do you have? Uh, it's just me and two other co-founders right now. Great. Mm -hmm. And how long uh, have you been running the service? When did it launch? Yeah, so uh, we launched it fully in early 2018. Okay. Um, so I graduated from UCLA in June, and we're living the glamorous life out of my parents' home in the South Bay right now, actually. Perfect, perfect. Well, at least you get the fish cakes yep. and uh, get to play Xbox in the basement. Congratulations, mm -hmm. and you're saving all that money. Yep. So uh, tell me, what is the biggest challenge you've got with tutorfly.org? Yeah, so the biggest challenge we have is with a lot of mar two-sided marketplaces, which is how do we incentivize our users, the tutors and the clients, to not circumvent the platform once they become familiar with each other? Okay, so I get this question a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll explain it to the audience in plain language. Okay. If you get in an Uber in the early days, uh, or if you were taking even carry car service before that or music car service, and you're paying them $125 for an airport job, mm -hmm. 
I would always get the name of the person, and the person would always hand you their business card yep. so they could route around mm -hmm. their uh, cab company. Yep. And they would say to you, hey, if you have another ride, contact me direct. Yeah. And I contact them direct and say, hey, it's 125 from Cary. What will you charge me? And they would typically say, oh, we'll charge you 75 bucks. So yep. we're both saving money because they were probably giving 60% to the cab company. Yep. Then Uber came out. Yep. Well, Uber has so many, you, you don't route around the Ubers. Yep. And the reason you don't route around at Uber is because Uber's only taking 20, 25%. Mm -hmm. So there is a poor point at which the, the rake, yep. the take from yep. the marketplace is so great yep. that people begrudge it and try to route around it. Yep. Um, so what is your take rate? What mm -hmm. percentage do you take from the tutors? Yeah. So right now it's between 33 and 40%. Um, and because they're high school and university students, relative to what they would be making, they're okay with it. Yeah. Um, but we're looking down the road where when this we're kind of really pushing this through and peer tutoring really becomes a something that you can do and it's pretty normal, um, that we're kind of looking ahead to see when people start hopping off the platform what we yeah. can do. Um, at first, when you said 30 or 33, mm -hmm. I was like, okay, no big deal. When you said 40, I started to say perhaps an issue. Yep. So I would just be generous from the beginning, gotcha. 25. Yep. Um, and then... Apple had the same issue. Apple takes 30%. Yeah. That seems reasonable. Yeah. But then for people who had subscription businesses like Netflix and Spotify, they're like, wait a second. Yep. People stay with our service for 10 yep. years. Yep. You get the subscription the first year, we give you 30%. But we don't want to give you 30% forever. Yep. That makes no sense. Yeah. And those platforms no longer let you subscribe through the App Store. Okay. However, other people like Calm do, yeah. and they benefit from that. So by giving the marketplace some of the take, yeah. you get promotion. Yeah. And so when you're coming up, yeah. People would do that. Now, if you became an all-star tutor, and which yeah. may or may not exist in your field, yeah. you, you're never going to be able to keep them forever. Like yep. A platform like AngelList isn't keeping me on their platform forever because yeah. I can do it without them. I'm bigger yep. than AngelList. I have yep. a bigger following. Yep. Uh, you know, I wrote the book on angel investing. Like, yeah, yeah. I don't need AngelList. Yeah. But in the beginning, they taught me a lot, and it was worth being on AngelList. Yeah. So realistically, you're not going to keep everybody. Mm -hmm. So that's what you have to think about. And then the other reasons people stay typically listed are insurance. Yep. So if you cover them in insurance, so yep. with the dog walking services, they want to have that million dollar insurance if in case the dog yep. you know, gets out of its collar and gets hit by a car, God forbid, yeah. and they don't personally get sued. So insurance yep. is another sticky one. Reputation system is another one. So if they really care about the reputation system, if I go around it, I don't get... Yeah. Uh, my reputation going up. Yeah. So reputation systems, another one. And then there's also this concept of fairness. Mm -hmm. Like, do I feel the platform deserves it? Yeah. So that's something where some people always want to cut corners and other mm -hmm. places may, may not. So back to the iTunes one, mm -hmm. they started charging, I think it's 15% on renewals. Yeah. So if you have a subscription business, 30% for the first year, but they only take 15% for the second year. So even yeah. Apple, yeah. which doesn't have to cut deals, realizes yeah. the rake can be the deciding factor between keeping and losing people. They should have cut a deal with Spotify and Netflix and said, for you, at your scale, yeah. we will take 5%. Yep. So they should just say, for anybody who has over 100 million in subscriptions going through the system, we yeah. drop it to a flat 5%. Yeah. It was a mistake on Apple's part. Okay. But many people don't want to give up the relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't sweat it too much. I would worry about having a world-class service yeah. Maybe having the insurance. Yeah. So if something happens, they have the blanket insurance. Yep. Maybe the reputation system. And then most of all, if you're delivering high quality customers over time, it really doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Right? So the the problem with routing around a system is, well, what if that driver is not available? So mm -hmm. if I use one of these you know, in-home massage things, okay, I love this masseuse. I want to go direct. But if I need a massage on Saturday, I'm really stressed out, and that person's on vacation or they're booked, I still want a massage. So sometimes it's the liquidity of the network that matters, right? Yeah. So I, I wouldn't oversweat this one. Okay. I would drop the rate down massively, make it 25%. Okay. Uh, or uh, make it 40% yeah. for the first one. And then if you do 10 in a month, you drop to 30. And if yeah. you do 20 sessions, you drop to 20. Yeah. And so a couple of comments on that. So the, the first part of it is we do sell bundles. So after the first or couple hours of tutoring, if it's the tutor gets a great review, we sell a, a bundle. So the parent's not going to hop off the platform if he or she's you know, paying a grand up front. But I guess a follow-up I have is the social impact component of our model is that 20% of our 1,000-plus tutors actually volunteer their time to raise money for local PTAs and charities. And so we haven't really been pushing the social impact portion of that. But do you think because of you know the rise of socially conscious consumers, we should really be more mindful about how we're framing um, this. Okay, trigger warning. Okay. Um, 
Don't ever bring up this social nonsense again. Okay. All right. It, with investors. Okay. They will look at this and say, you're not a cutthroat founder okay. and that you're a do-gooder and you okay. want to save the world. Now, they're okay. not going to say that. Okay. They're going to say, in fact, the exact opposite. Okay. Like, oh my God, so social good, that's so important to us. Okay. And then they're going to look at your business and go, does this uh, add to our ability to make 100 times our investment or does it take away? <laughs> if you're such a do-gooder that they feel it's going to throttle the business mm -hmm. or that you're giving away too much money and it mm -hmm. impacts their 100x, they're not going to do it. Now, if yeah. you say... Listen, we're going to give, you know, for every 10, you know, sessions, we're going to give one to, um, yeah. you know, an underprivileged person. And we're doing that not just because it's the right thing to do. Candidly, yeah. um, we're doing it because uh, we'll convert more people. There's a group okay. of people that when they hear we're doing this, they'll spend more with us. Okay. Take that cutthroat approach to it. Okay. Independent of what you think. Okay. You may actually care about the world and yeah. you might be like yeah. such a great human being yeah. that you're going to get 10 gold stars and a high yeah. five and a cookie. Yeah. Congratulations. But with this crowd, yeah. you need to be come across as cutthroat. Okay. So when presenting any social nonsense, I mean social good, yeah. make sure it's perceived okay. as cutthroat. Okay. That there is a business reason for that because nobody in the venture community yeah. is doing this. Yeah. To do good in the world. Yeah. They're doing it explicitly to get a return. Yeah. If they say they're doing it to do good in the world, they're lying. Okay. Because if they don't make a profit, they don't get their next fund. Okay. And if you don't make a profit, you don't get your next quarter to operate your business. Your business yep. goes out of business. Yep. If you want to do a nonprofit, do a nonprofit yep. and go beg for money with your hat out. Yeah. If you want to do a cutthroat venture back business, do that. Okay. And take all your money and success and give it away. Okay. And if, if I can follow up on that, so we what I'm taking away is I should have framed it differently where we didn't spend any money on marketing advertising the first year. It was 20% of our tutors volunteer, so local charities, PTA groups are getting the money. It's a marketing play. Yeah, it's so presented they're, as such. They're, they're, yeah, so they're promoting TutorFly, and that's how we're getting more clients. Literally call it a marketing. Okay. In your so marketing section, like say we have three marketing techniques okay. that work for us. One, yeah. our customer acquisition cost on LinkedIn is X. Okay. Uh, two, we do content marketing where we solve the hardest problems yep. that we know come up all the time on yep. YouTube and we promote those videos yep. locally using geotagging and retargeting yep. and then we you know get people to convert over and three we give away hours okay. at schools and at nonprofits and we ask them to hand out cards okay. to people who need tutoring and it's one of our it just cuts our acquisition so the $20 we lose because we actually pay the tutors for that hour yep. the $20 we lose on that hour we make back okay from the goodwill okay boom okay awesome. Well done. Good luck with your business. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, you should definitely come to Founding University and apply to the accelerator. Okay. You seem like you're in that range. So.